Um, if I just go through the agenda, so that's, uh, as I say, Clyde Brady, BWA chairman, and welcome. Um, so, with obviously the end of the transition period in sight, um, we as a, a trade association thought it important that we reach out to our members uh, and start to focus. And no disrespect, sorry, if people have already started to focus, which obviously clearly they should have done so, but really to, to bring a focal point and, and, and to get people to start to focus on what the 1st of January 2020 one is going to bring, particularly around the excise um, arena for us. So we've reached out um, uh, to, to Mike Gilmore, who, who's kindly um, uh, joined us today uh, to, to present uh, around the topics there that I've highlighted there. So around the EU exit and the exit sector, COVID-19 easements and CDS. So a big thank you to Mike and we're hopeful his colleague Paul uh, Davison will join us uh, a, a bit later. Mike will introduce himself, no doubt, but Mike is the lead uh, on on the excise and environmental taxes transition and modernisation policy. So uh, we'll have great insight in terms to where we're at in the process uh, and as we gather momentum towards the, the tra end of the transition period. As you can see from the agenda, and I'll just open this up a little bit further for you is that we have Mike speaking, we have Paul Davidson speaking, and and also wanted to open up a Q and A panel session, uh, which which are hosts, but Mike uh, and Paul hopefully will we'll sit on that, and we'll also have Mark uh, Robotham from Port Cullis ICS uh, will join uh, Mike and Paul on that uh, Q and A session, and hopefully. You know, we have some pre-lodged questions, which um, uh, the guys on the panel uh, will be in a, hopefully in a position to answer. But um, please ask any questions uh, as we go through this. So what we want to do is, is Graham Sheen, our secretary, will collate those uh, those answers. So obviously with Teams, you have the conversation icon and the ability to open uh, up a question or go into the, the message or chat facility. If you can pose your question in that um, as we go through, so rather interrupt Mike and Paul as they go through their presentations, if we can just collate that uh, and, and then uh, Graham will will pull those together and then we can, we can have a meaningful Q&A with uh, Graham posing those questions uh, in that session. Um, just for everybody's information, um, we are recording this uh, this afternoon, and, and that's obviously for members who couldn't join us or unable to join us, uh, then then they've requested we record them, and we will be able to uh, send that uh, that send that recording uh, on to you. So I think I've I've covered most things around housekeeping and, and the background to to. Um, uh, this is the, the, this webinar, which is the first for BWA, so we're, we're hopeful this goes well and hopefully gives you uh, insight and information and the clarity you need as uh, as your businesses uh, head towards uh, the 1st of January. So without further ado, as my Scottish colleagues would say, um, I'd like to hand over to, to Mike Gilmore.
Well, some possible agreements on things like facilitations, import and export, and how we can make things easier importing to and from the EU, mainly from a customs perspective, but they will also have a knock on, on excise. So as and when they uh, become finalised, uh, we will update you on those in terms of how those will work. So in terms of the transition period, as, as you'll have probably seen numerous times from the government, the, the, uh, uh, they have stressed that there will no, not be an extension to the transition. So we will not be extending that. Uh, that will end on the 31st of December and we will be fully out of the EU. But what that does mean is that we won't necessarily have everything in place in time for the end of the transition period. And you'll have seen a week or two's back uh, an announcement in, in relation to what we're calling a staged introduction of customs controls. And this means that everything won't be in place in terms of, of imports and exports uh, for the 31st of December. And we will be spending the six months after that up to July introducing uh, further controls as we go along. Uh, there's a different process for controlled goods and non-controlled goods. Uh, controlled goods are being, uh, the, the list of controlled goods is being finalised at the moment, but it will include excise goods, so it will include alcohol, tobacco and uh, oils and fuels on there. And there will be a different process for that. For non-controlled goods, it's going to be quite straightforward in terms of, of the process, in terms of the goods getting in, uh, and we will be looking at uh, the uh, the full declaration and and all the uh, the bits that uh, link into that uh, six months later rather than at the time that the goods are imported so we do have that that uh, easement in terms of provision of the full entry declaration uh, on import as i say that is different for excise uh, and all other control goods where basically there will be two options at import you can you can either put in a full declaration as you do now, uh, pay the pay the duty, clear them to free circulation, uh, so pay the excise duty, the customs duty, and the VAT, or you can put them into suspensory procedures, things like uh, customs warehousing, things like excise warehousing. So uh, the full declaration is an option, uh, or there is the option of a simplified declaration, and this is based upon the CFSP system, the Customs Rate Simplified Procedure System. And this is where you put in a simplified declaration before the goods hit the UK. The goods will then be manually arrived, a bit like the old TSP system that we had for no deal. So the goods will be manually arrived uh, by the end of the next working day. If they're going into duty suspension, they also need to be put on EMCS by the end of the next working day. And then a supplementary declaration will be submitted uh, at, uh, by the end of the next month and then the duty accounted for under the CFSP procedures. What it does mean is if you want to use the simplified declaration procedure you need to be approved either for CFSP yourself or we are opening, opening this up so that CFSP can be operated by third parties and intermediaries. So you can use somebody else that is approved for CFSP and they can put the, supplement, uh, the simplified declaration in on your behalf. So that's the, the, the bit that's slightly different to the TSP process that we had in place for no deal it is slightly different uh, for the end of the transition period. So that's that's how the import process will work. Uh, in terms of after that, it will be basically the same in terms of what happens now for the rest of the world imports. So anybody that wants to put goods into excise warehousing, uh, goods will need to go onto EMCS and that will be used to control the movement to the warehouse and then all the domestic excise uh, rules will continue to apply in terms of things like drawback and warehousing. Uh, it's just really the imports and export process uh, that uh, is changing. The, the export system, we've not yet released what the, uh, the full uh, policy is going to be in terms of exports. We are looking at similar types of easements for exports to make things easier, uh, but we are not expecting there to be any change in terms of excise. We, for excise, we will still be requiring uh, an export declaration and the departure message, uh, and that will uh, all be used in terms of closing down the MCS movements and also evidence of export for things like duty drawback. So that's where we are in terms of, of the staged control. So if we, if we can go on to the next slide. Thank you. So what, what does it then mean for excise? So I uh, touched a little bit on this. 
we are basically uh, reverting to our existing best of the world rules uh, in terms of closing off the way that we move excise goods with the EU. So we'll no longer have EMCS to cover movements direct from the EU into the UK. We'll no longer have things like the distance selling arrangements or we won't have things like the SAAD process that we use for duty paid goods. That will all go. It will just revert to uh, declarations at import, uh, declarations at exports. Uh, we will continue to use the MCS for internal excise purposes. So we will use it as we do now for internal movements between warehouses. We will use it between for movements between the ports and inland and also from the warehouse to the port for exports. Uh, we are not going to change any of the exemptions and simplifications that we have around due to suspension. So we're not going to be bringing any additional excise products on or changing the rules. So what's, what uses the MCS now will continue to use the MCS in the future. Uh, to do that, we're going to have to do some changes to MCS and I'll come on to that a little bit later on. We're going to change the drawback rules. Uh, as you're probably aware, there are, there are three different mechanisms for drawback at the moment. There's dispatches to the EU, there's exports and there's destructions. And there's different rules in relation to the evidence to back up those claims for those. The rules will change in terms of movements to the EU because we'll no longer have the SAAD process. So that will go. And we will basically just have the two different scenarios. We will have the drawback for destruction or we will have the, the drawback for exports. And what we will do is we will be aligning the rules in terms of evidence of exports for exports to the EU to, to match what we currently have for uh, exports to the rest of the world. So we will just be taking out that type of, of drawback and, and aligning it with the rest of the world rules. There's quite a lot of legislation that we're going to have to lay ahead of the transition, the end of the transition period. Uh, some of that has already actually been laid in terms of the various no deal SIs. We will be using those as the basis for uh, the, the legislation in place for the end of, of the transition period. So things like uh, the various miscellaneous SIs, SIs and the holding and movement duty point amendment SI, uh, they will be the starting point for the changes that we need to make between now and the end of the transition period. Uh, we are working on, on the legislation in various drafts. So the first tranche is, is all the GB legislation, and we're currently with solicitors drafting that at the moment. So that will be the first lot of legislation that we'll lay. There'll then be the second tranche, which is all around Northern Ireland. Uh, and then there'll be the third tranche, which will be the things that we need to mop up where there's gaps or where policy is developed quite late. We will be looking to share legislation with you. Uh, we'll be looking to share that via email this time rather than uh, reading rooms, what we did last year, uh, because a lot of the policies weren't released until quite late in the day. Uh, we, we were restricted in terms of how we could share the draft SIs. This time, we're not going to have that because a lot of the policies are already out there. So what we will be doing is we will be sharing draft SIs with uh, trusted external stakeholders. Uh, and that will be uh, the members of the Joint Alcohol Tobacco Coordination Group so that you can look at the SIs before they are laid uh, and give the opportunity for you to feed back and highlight any issues. Uh, and we will be doing that when, in, in time for you to be able to feed that back. Unlike last time where it was sometimes a matter of days before they were laid, uh, we will be hoping to share things well in advance so that you do have the, the proper opportunity to look at, at that. Uh, we have got the precedent for doing that now. Uh, we shared uh, an updated version of Notice 197 by email a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so that has really sort of set the precedent to allow us to, to do this via email. Uh, so that's what we will be doing in terms of the legislation. Uh, there's quite a lot of legislation to lay. There's not just the excise. There's also a load of customs SIs that need to be laid. Uh, there's the VAT ones. Uh, there's there's cross-cutting ones on things like passengers and duty-free. And then there will be a whole range of Northern Ireland legislation that will cover the Northern Ireland protocol for customs, VAT and excise. So we will uh, we will be making sure that you copy it into to all those different uh, types of, of, of legislation. OK, if we can move on to the next slide, please. OK, so we'll, we'll look at it specifically for imports and, and exports. And this is just repeating a little bit what I'm, I've said, but uh, basically for anybody importing goods, excise goods from the EU, uh, you will need to make an import declaration, either that full declaration or a simplified declaration. 
if you want to move if you want to use a simplified declaration process you will either have to uh, get yourself approved for cfsp uh, or you will need to find the services of a, an agent or intermediary that is approved already and use their services so that's one of the things really to to think about whether or not you're going to be doing the full declarations or the simplified declarations you've then got the option as i mentioned earlier to to clear everything at the port uh, in which case you would need uh, an agent to put your declaration in you would need something like deferment account uh, in terms of the duty uh, or if you want to put them into excise warehousing or customs warehousing uh, you can do that using the appropriate procedure codes and declaring it on chief. If they're going into customs warehousing, the customs rules will apply. And we are not, from an excise perspective, too interested in those goods until they actually come out of the customs warehouse. If they're going to an excise warehouse, they need to go onto EMCS. So they need the services of a registered consignor to get them onto EMCS. Uh, as I mentioned, under the phased model, they, they've got to go on to EMCS no later than the next working day uh, to make sure that uh, the goods are controlled via EMCS. Uh, and then EMCS will control that movement from the port inland to, the, to, uh, to your trader's premises where the movement will get discharged as it does now. So that's how the imports bit will work. So if we can move on to the next slide. Exports, very similar to what happens now in terms of the rest of the world, no real change. Uh, so anybody exporting goods uh, will need to make an export declaration. Uh, you can move goods under it from a excise warehousing under a couple of different mechanisms. So things like local clearance procedure will still be available for businesses. So for those that have got it, it will continue to operate as it does now. And the goods will move from the trader's premises to the port under LCP or Custom Supervised Exports, as it's now called. Uh, and that's available for anybody else that wants to apply uh, and take advantage of that. If you're not approved for that and you're moving duty suspended goods, they will move as they do now for a, 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 a direct export. So the goods would need to be entered onto EMCS as, as an export. Uh, that EMCS movement would cover those goods to the port of exports. There'd be an export declaration. And then as a result of that export declaration and the departure message, that would then feed back onto EMCS to close down the EMCS movement uh, and, and uh, discharge the liability in terms of things like the movement guarantee. So that's how that will, uh, will work. We'll continue to operate duty drawback, as I said. So anybody that's dealing in duty paid goods, uh, we will continue to offer duty drawback for any goods that are not consumed in the UK, including, including exports. And then the other thing just to bear in mind is that uh, that's covering the export from, from uh, the UK, that there's also then the import requirements in terms of uh, the goods hitting the EU. So there will then be requirements for things like import declarations, and if the goods are, are traveling in due suspension, to get the goods onto the EU EMCS systems, you would need the facilities to do that. So it's not just the export that you need to, you need to prepare for, it's also uh, to have somebody to be able to put the goods onto the various EU custom systems and get them cleared and get them onto the EMCS systems for due suspended movements. Unfortunately, I'm not too sure how it works in the EU. Uh, uh, so that's something really that I can't, I can't help too much with. My customs colleagues might be able to point you in the right direction, but I think the first, the, the best sort of starting point is that the various customs authorities in, in the EU countries that you're exporting to, they will be able to provide you with advice in terms of how you get the goods onto the systems and what you need to do to do that. Okay, can we move on to the next slide, please? Okay, so in relation to, to the changes then, we need to do quite a few changes to excise uh, IT systems. Uh, we need to change EMCS. Uh, there's various changes that we need to do to EMCS. Uh, at the moment, we are going through uh, an upgrade, an EU-wide upgrade, uh, 3.4. Not any real major changes as a result of this. It's more to do with some of the reports and some of the messaging, uh, but we've not yet completed it from a UK perspective. Phase one of upgrade 3.4 was implemented in uh, February, on February the 13th, and that went through okay. But there is a second phase that we need to implement, uh, and we are aiming to do that uh, by the end of July, start of August. That's the plans. 
that's what hopefully Paul's going to talk about uh, wh when he joins us. He will talk us through the changes that are required to, to EMCS and what our plans are for that. But we also need to do quite a few other changes to EMCS before the end of the transition period. Uh, there's basically uh, three changes that will take place uh, between now and uh, the end of May 2021. And then there will be a further change uh, in, in uh, four years time. And I'll just talk you through what those changes are. So the first change that we will do is on the 24th of December. Uh, and, and this is something that happened in the run up to the potential no deal exit dates. Uh, we did this twice before. And this is a change that prevents any preloading of movements on EMCS. So these are movements that are going to take place after uh, the 31st of December. So after the 24th of December, you won't be able to preload any further movements that take place after the 31st. So that change will go in at 11 o'clock on the 24th of, of December and we will update you on that. We'll put some comments out about that and we will be liaising with software houses in terms of the changes required to, to, to EMCS. So that will then take place. Uh, there'll then be a further change that will take place uh, at 11 o'clock on the 31st of December. And this is the main change to EMCS. And this is where we will take away the functionality that allows movements between the UK and the EU. So that will be switched off. Uh, in the MCS, we'll basically have two different types of movements. You'll have the the uh, movements between UK warehouses and you will have the movements to and from the port. Uh, the EU one uh, will be switched off, as will communications with the EU in relation to any new movements. So no new movements will be able to be transferred uh, after 11 o'clock on the 31st to the EU. Mm. There'll then be another series of changes that will take place uh, on the 31st of May uh, 2021. Sorry, the slide is is, uh, is incorrect there. It says 2020. It's actually 2021. And this is to uh, deal with what we call goods in flight. So these are the movements that have started ahead of the 31st of December. Uh, we need to keep communications open in relation to these movements to allow them to run their natural course and for them to be closed. So we will have a window open with the EU uh, and they will with us to allow us to close down these movements that are in flight when we end the transition period. And I'll talk about separation issues in a second in terms of what that means. And then, as I say, there'll be a further change that will take place in 2024. And this is because as part of the withdrawal agreement, we will still keep uh, a, a messaging function between ourselves and the EU to allow us to exchange information in relation to movements that took place before the end of the transition period, because we will be still cooperating in terms of historic movements for a period of four years. We need to keep some communications open on EMCS to allow us to exchange information because that's the mechanism we use. So there will be some communications kept open on EMCS till 2024, uh, in which case that will be switched off. And after that date, EMCS will be a complete standalone UK system. So there's quite a lot of changes we need to do to EMCS. Uh, we're working on those at the moment. We're working on the specifications and we will be hoping to get those out as soon as we can so that software houses and businesses uh, will be able to start planning for those changes. There will also be some other IT changes. Uh, so for anybody that deals in duty paid goods, as I say, we're switching off the current duty paid processes that we have. So we will we'll be switching off the red system, which is the IT system that we use to operate uh, the uh, duty paid processes. We'll also be making a few changes to the ATWD system, which is the system that we use for processing uh, warehouse uh, removals. Uh, and the reason we need to change ATWD is uh, because some of the forms are accessible via ATWD. So for example, the W1 and things like that, we need to change the forms. So it's not so much the, the actual the processing bit of ATWD, it's the forms that you access via it that we need to change. And again, we'll be sharing lots of information in terms of that uh, ahead of the end of the transition. Uh, just in terms of, uh, of systems as well, just a few other things that you need to, uh, to be aware of. As I say, if you are uh, importing goods from the EU, uh, you'll need an ERI number to make a customs declaration. So any businesses that have only ever dealt with the EU before and not dealt with the rest of the world imports might not have an ERI number. So that's something that you need to prepare and, and to apply to customs to get one. It's a fairly straightforward uh, process. 
so it, it shouldn't take too long uh, but you will need to do that before you can start making declarations after the 31st of December. You'll need access to an agent if you're not going to make the declarations yourself. So if you're going to use a third party to make import and export declarations, you'll need to secure uh, the services of an agent. Again, if you've only ever been dealing with the EU, this is something that will be new to you. Uh, we are expecting there to be uh, an increase in terms of the number of agents uh, and intermediaries to cope with the amount of additional traffic. And there are various grants and, and schemes available uh, for, for businesses to use to uh, recruit and, and grow their services in terms of things like agents and, and intermediaries. If you want to use, uh, <coughs> sorry, if you want to use the simplified declarations process, you'll need uh, access to either a CFSP registered agent or you will need to seek approval yourself. And if you're going to be entering goods onto excise duty suspension, you will need either to be approved as a registered consignor yourself or have access to a registered consignor. And they will have to have the access to the gateways to allow declarations to go on to EMCS. So these are some of the things that businesses need to be thinking about now if they've not got these things in place and they need to start the ball rolling. Uh, because one of the things that will probably happen is uh, there'll be um, probably a little bit of a last minute rush as, as some people aren't aware of what they need to do or they leave it till the last minute. Uh, and then there could be a rush on things like uh, applications for registered consignors or ERs. Uh, so to, to, to save that and to save the possible risk of not getting things in place in time, we're recommending that businesses start taking steps now. OK, if we can move on to the next slide, please. OK, separation issues. This is the one real big difference to what was uh, in place uh, for no deal. Because for no deal it was, we were basically going it alone. Uh, we had no agreement in terms of what would happen for movements that had started ahead of the, the exiting of the EU. However, because of the deal and because of the agreements on the withdrawal agreement, uh, we do have a reciprocal arrangement with the EU. Uh, and that arrangement is that anything that starts to move before 11 o'clock on the 31st of December will be allowed to continue under the rules that were in place at that time until they until that movement gets to uh, to an end so for example for an excise duty suspended movement any excise duty suspended movement that's been dispatched from a warehouse before 11 o'clock on the 31st will be able to continue to run on the uh, emcs system there will be no need for export declarations import declarations those goods will continue to run under the old rules until they get to the receiving warehouse where the goods will be received and a, a report of receipt sent to close the movement down, which is why we need to keep the communications open until the end of, end of May. So any duty suspended movements can continue and the new rules won't apply. You don't have to put in declarations. You don't have to pay the customs duty or anything like that. They will continue as they are. There will be rules in relation to what you need to do to prove that. So, for example, uh, if you get stopped by Border Force, you would need to be able to reference uh, an ARC number to show that the movement started ahead of 11 o'clock on the 31st. Uh, and that's basically it. There'll be a similar process in relation to duty paid goods. So any duty paid movements that have started ahead of 11 o'clock on the 31st can continue to. Uh, the slight difference being the evidence will be the SAAD that will be uh, the evidence to show that the goods have started a movement in case in case they do get stopped at the port, either export or import. And that is an agreement between the UK and the whole of the EU, so that will apply. Uh, we will be putting out guidance to businesses. The EU uh, will also be doing the same. Uh, there is a slight question at the moment over uh, changes of destination. Uh, for, for some of you, you might have seen that the EU put out an excise note uh, about six weeks or so ago. And part of that covered what will happen at the end of the transition period, and it talked about separation issues. And that note said that the EU is not going to allow changes of destination for goods that started before the 31st. Our view is that we should be allowed to do changes of destination. So we just need to square that off with the EU to make sure that we, we are aligned. But we want to allow changes of destination. So that's one of the things we'll be trying to get the EU to change their minds on. So we will put out guidance to businesses. Uh, we will also be laying legislation, so there will be some specific new uh, items within the excise size that we will be laying that will cover uh, goods in flight. 
This will also apply not just to excise, it'll apply to customs and it'll apply to VAT. Uh, so the, there will be different rules in place in relation to all the different customs procedures and, for example, things that are in a customs warehouse and things like that. So uh, I'd urge you to check the customs guidance when it comes out on goods in flight as well, because there, there will be a whole raft of, of information specifically in relation to that too. OK, if we can move on to the next slide. So this really is just a, a sort of a, a bit of a prompt in terms of business readiness. These are the sort of the, the messages that we're trying to get across uh, to businesses to make themselves prepared before the end of the transition period. So to uh, liaise with their software developers in terms of the IT changes to make sure that those are all implemented in time for the end of the transition period. Uh, to get access to a registered consignor and get access to MCS if they're going to be uh, importing goods into duty suspension to get an ERV number and an agent if they're going to be using uh, customs declarations and using a third party to, to do declarations for them. And to familiarise yourselves with the various changes, we will be changing uh, not just the legislation, we'll be updating all our public notices, we'll be updating the guidance on gov.uk and we will be updating our forms as well. Uh, similarly to the legislation, we will be sharing these changes with you uh, ahead of that. So what we will do is we will give you the opportunity to see any changes to the public notices before they are published. Uh, what we, The way we will do this is a bit like we did uh, with No Deal. We have a specific uh, group set up as part of the Joint Alcohol Tobacco Coordination Group, uh, and we will use that as the mechanism. So we will give you a list of all the notices that are changing and all the forms that are changing, and we will give you the opportunity to indicate which ones you want to have a look at. Because we don't want to send everything out. We're talking hundreds of forms and we're talking uh, over 80 notices. So we don't want to swamp everybody with things that might not be of interest. So we will give the trade associations the opportunity to pick the ones that they want to look at. We will then share them electronically, give you the opportunity to see them before the changes uh, are implemented uh, and give us some feedback. And then once those are published, we will, we will notify businesses and we will send links. Uh, in terms of uh, making sure that people have access to those. So we will try and signpost as much of this as we can. There'll also be changes to VAT notices and customs notices and customs forms. So again, you also need to, to bear that in mind. This is just purely the excise bit that I'm talking about today. Okay, so next slide. Okay, I'll just quickly touch on passages and parcels. Uh, parcels, I'll start with first because parcels is the very easy one. Parcels, nothing has changed in terms of the excise policy uh, that we had for no deal. It's going to be exactly the same for the end of the transition period. Uh, and what that will mean is that any parcels coming into the UK uh, will use the current rest of the world processes. Uh, so irrespective of where they're coming from, uh, it will be down to the parcel operator to collect the excise duty plus any customs duty and import VAT from the recipient, a bit like what happens now. So if you're if you're importing uh, bourbon, a bottle of bourbon from uh, from the USA, uh, for example, you would get a note through your letterbox or a letter saying we've got this parcel. You need to uh, go online, call in the post office, or ring us up, pay all the various duties, and then we will deliver it. That's what will happen in terms of, of excise parcels. There will be a slightly different process in place uh, for non-excise goods. Uh, and there's a consultation that has just taken place on the new uh, system that will come in in terms of parcels, non-excise parcels. But in terms of excise ones, uh, that's the process. It's, it's the existing rest of the world process. Passengers is a little bit more complicated uh, because we will have a completely different policy to what we were intending for no deal. Uh, 